Well, good evening, and welcome to church tonight. I'm Terry Kotzma, and it's an honor for me to be here, even if it's only from across the street. So, I'm not aware of any announcements, unless anybody has any at this point. Uh, let's invite the Holy Spirit to be in our presence tonight in silent prayer. If you are able, please stand for the Lord's greeting. Tonight, it comes to us from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's take a minute to greet those around us. It looks like we're uh, still in the age of COVID. Everybody is socially distant, distanced there. Um, we'll start out with two hymns tonight. First one is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We don't get to sing this very often, so we probably did last week, but let's sing it again this week. So 469, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, all four verses.
And staying on the same page, let's sing number 470, all hail the power of Jesus' name, all four verses. Please remain standing for our confession. Normally we do the Apostles' Creed and sometimes the Nicene Creed. I thought it would be nice tonight to recite the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. So I'll read the question and let's together say the answer. What is your only comfort in life and death? And in a nod to our Presbyterian friends, let's recite the Westminster Shorter Catechism question and answer one. Again, I'll say the question and let's together say the answer. What is the chief end of man?
Please be seated. Let's pray for the Spirit's leading. Prepare our hearts, O God, to hear your word and obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Well, tonight we're going to take a little bit of a break from the Belgic Confession. It's been an interesting series, uh, seeing how relevant the confessions were centuries ago and how relevant they are today. But tonight we're going to do a study on Stephen the Martyr. What does it mean to be a martyr? It's more than just to be teased or mocked or persecuted for your faith. A martyr is defined as a person who is killed because of their religious or other beliefs. Are you ready to be a martyr? Does God expect us to be martyrs for our faith? How strong is your faith and my faith? Tonight we're going to take a look at Stephen the first recorded martyr. The book of Acts starts in the year 30 AD with the founding of the church in Jerusalem and at Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's thought that the stoning of Stephen occurred in the year 32 AD. So, you know, we think we have a lot of controversy in the church and all these denominations and fighting. Apparently, that started only two years after the start of the beginning of the church. So, if you could turn your attention to Acts 6, and we'll try to work with Beth. We're going to go uh, uh, kind of back and forth in the scripture. This is found on page 1700 in, in your pew Bibles. Beginning with verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And in my um, margin of my Bible, I had a notation that Pastor Zach did a sermon five years ago, October 30, 2016, that was entitled, To Wait on Tables. Um, serving at tables can be a, a euphemism or a saying for, for banking or for the other ongoing disputes in the community, which up to this point in, in Luke's narrative really concerned about money and not so much about food. Back to the scripture, verse 3. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith of, and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's step back and look at these verses here. A few years after Pentecost, the apostles are continuing to grow the church in Jerusalem, but they haven't yet left Jerusalem to proclaim, to proclaim the gospel elsewhere throughout the world. 
This would soon change. In the first seven verses that we just read, Luke tells us that the Hellenists started complaining about their widows being neglected in the daily charitable distribution. Hellenists are Jews who speak Greek as their first language and who probably understood very little Hebrew or Aramaic. These are Jews who lived outside of Palestine but then moved to Jerusalem at some point in their adult lives. The Jews who grew up in around Palestine and Judea, Samaria, Galilee spoke primarily Aramaic and Hebrew and not Greek, which was their second language. So in that day, devout Greek-speaking Jewish men would often move with their wives to Jerusalem or the surrounding area so they could live their final days in the Holy Land near the temple. The husbands would frequently die first and leave behind widows. I guess things aren't any different today than what they were then. Uh, so there were no family nearby to take care of them. Jews took very seriously the biblical command to care for the widows. There were weekly and daily distributions to widows. Widows could be a general term to refer to all of the poor who are in need of assistance. According to one commentator, the daily distribution typically consisted of bread, beans, and fruit. The weekly distribution consisted of food and clothing. The early church was likely implementing some sort of a system. We're not told why the Hellenist widows are being ignored, but it was probably because of church growth. The apostles were dealing with thousands of people, and they were not as familiar with the Greek-speaking widows as what they were with the Hebrew widows, so they could have accidentally just omitted them from distribution. In any case, the, the apostles needed to focus on prayer and preaching and teaching and the added burden of administering charity to the Hellenist widows could be too much for them to handle. So they wisely asked some of the Hellenist Jews to nominate from their group seven men who could take over the distribution to the Hellenist widows. They had to be men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom. And we, wrote, or we, we spoke about those seven that were uh, chosen, including Stephen and Philip, who were uh, spoken about in later parts of the book of Acts. Luke also notes, Luke the author of Acts, also notes that the number of converts continued to increase in Jerusalem and that Priests, Levitical priests were included in that number. One commentator was noting that the conversion of a large group of priests, we read those, those words, has important meaning. First of all, that the priests came to Jesus as previous opponents, so they must have assessed the, the claims of the apostles and found that they were convincing. Second of all, they would have checked the scriptures carefully before deciding that the claims the apostles had made about Jesus and God's salvation were true. Third, they would have been aware of the harsh views that the Jewish officials took on Jesus, so their daring to come to faith indicates that their conviction was strong enough that they were willing to suffer the scorn that their conversion would, would invite. And, and finally... In converting from the, the camp of opposition, the priests were able to supply the faith community with insider information on the official priestly assessment of Jesus and his followers. Let's go back to the scripture, Beth. We're now on verse 8. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. 
Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit had given him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So starting in in verse 8, Luke writes that Stephen is performing miracles and preaching in a, in a particular Hellenist synagogue whose members included uh, former Roman, Roman slaves and Jews from other parts of the Roman Empire. Some members of the synagogue argue with Stephen and attempt to discredit his teaching, but Stephen's words are irrefutable because he is filled with the Spirit. Since they cannot silence Stephen with argumentation, they accuse him of blasphemy. Stephen is arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin to defend himself. So witnesses at the council hearing stand up and they say this about Stephen, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place in the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. The holy place is the temple. So Stephen is accused of speaking against the temple and the law given by Moses. So what follows next is chapter 7, which is the, the speech given by Stephen. And um, this stretches from verse 2 all the way to verse 53. And, and um, we're just going to kind of go through this like really quickly. And, and as you can see, the first couple of verses um, uh, have to do with, with Abraham verses 2 through 8, and then it has to do with Joseph, beginning in verse 9, and then in verse 20 is, is Moses, uh, the story of Moses and how God had used him. And um, uh, so, Beth, let's pick it up at verse 51. Verse 51, where we're getting to uh, the culmination, or... I can't see that. Is it, are we at verse 51? And I have to apologize to the people upstairs there. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is the, the end of the speech. The, the, and you can imagine back then, we don't have nice uh, speaker systems like we have here tonight. Uh, there's probably crowds of people. And at this point, Stephen is yelling at the top of his, top of his voice, Beginning at verse 51, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. So 
We skipped most of the speech. We, we talked about verses 2 through 8 is about Abraham, 9 through 16 is about Joseph, 17 through 43 is about Moses and the Exodus. And Stephen emphasizes the struggle that Moses had with the people and their constant misunderstanding. And, and you know, he ends the story about Moses with the, their utter uh, disobedience. They're worshiping the calf. And According to one commentator, you know, this whole, this whole speech is really meant, there's two major themes in here, and, and these are the themes that, that stand out. The first is that God can never be tied down to one land or place, and, and correspondingly, his people are closest to him when they are a pilgrim people or a people on the move. Remember, the, the tabernacle, or the uh, 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 temple moving uh, when they were in, during Exodus. The second major theme is that of, of Israel's pattern of constantly resisting and rejecting its God-appointed leaders. The second theme real also has a Christ emphasis, which ultimately is the main goal of the of this speech. Israel's past points to the present. The pattern of rejection in the past foreshadows the ultimate rejection of God's appointed Messiah in the present. Other themes that are related to this major one, and um, the fulfillment of Israel's true worship is in the, in the Messiah, and in rejecting him, they were rejecting ultimately what the temple is all about. So related to those, these two themes is, is Stephen's thoughts about the temple. Stephen is accused of denigrating the temple, but that's, that's a misunderstanding. One commentator says that, that Stephen did not reject the temple, but as such it was more the abuse of the temple, which made it into something other than a place for offering worship to God. His view is, is linked closely to that of Jesus, who was also attacking the abuses of the temple cult and stressed the true purpose of the temple being a house of prayer. We read about that in Luke 19, verse 46. So the particular abuse that, that Stephen addressed was the use of the temple to restrict or to confine or ultimately to try to manipulate God. This seems to be the significance of his contrast between the tabernacle and the temple. The tabernacle was designed and approved by God. It was a dwelling place for him, but it was not a house of God. And it is the concept of the house to which Stephen objected. And this was his house and, and, and nowhere else. And, and Stephen directly challenges his audience, calls them you stiff-necked people and uncircumcised and hardened ears. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your, your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you've now betrayed. So the Jews accusing Stephen are acting exactly as their ancestors did. The ancestors persecuted and killed God's prophets, and now they've killed the very Messiah whom the prophets had predicted. It's likely that Stephen had more to say, but he never gets the chance. Sensing the, the rage of his audience, he stops his speech and he receives a vision from God. In the vision, he sees Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God, and he tells the assembly there what he's seen. So back to the scripture, uh, Beth, we're on, on verse 54. Verse 54, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. 
Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. Why was Stephen stoned? Well, we build up to this, the final condemnation here. He's, he's retelling, he, his, he shifts from, from our people to you people. And he says, you are uncircumcised in your heart. He says, you killed the prophets, you opposed the Holy Spirit, you received the law, but did not keep it. So when accused of speaking against the Torah and threatening the temple, he turns his accusations instead against right, right to them. Another commentator says, when Stephen proclaims that he sees the Son of Man, Jesus, standing at the right hand of the Father, it's just too much. In their view, Stephen is attacking the very uniqueness of God by suggesting that there is one standing next to him in heaven. They see this as a clear act of blasphemy. This difference over Jesus and all that grows out of it is key to the conflict and the parting of ways between Jews and the new, the new community. So the crowd from the synagogue grab him and drag him outside the city walls to be stoned to death as the synagogue witnesses remove their cloaks so they can stone him. You know, you want to get ready to, you want to take your coat off so that you can have a good, uh, good arm, a good throw. So Luke tells that there's this young man named Saul who is guarding the cloaks. And here we have our first introduction to the man who would ultimately write most of the letters contained in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. But before Saul would become Paul, he would persecute the Jerusalem church. What a story that is to see how God can use somebody who was behind the persecution and turn him around like he did with Paul. The martyrdom of Stephen would participate into a, a full-blown conflict between the church and the Jews of Jerusalem. The conflict would finally force some members to leave Jerusalem, and that, of course, is what began the spread of the gospel throughout Judea and Samaria. Um, another commentator uh, summarizes by saying, uh, you know, we look at someone who paid the ultimate price for faith, martyrdom. Stephen dies not only seeing Jesus standing in heaven, to receive, but is also praying for those who killed him. Stephen dies as Jesus died and follows his example. So we see some similarities between Stephen's and Jesus' death as parallel in, in the book of Luke and in the book of Acts. There were false accusations. Jesus had false accusations against him. Stephen had false accusations against him. They both trusted in God. Jesus said, Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46. Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In verse 59. They both talk about the right hand of God. Jesus, during the trial, says, The Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the Father. Luke 22, verse 69. Stephen ends, culminates his testimony, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, Acts 7, verse 56. They both exhibit forgiveness. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That was Luke 23, 34. As Stephen was being stoned, Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Also, the centurion that was watching Jesus said, surely this man was innocent. That was Luke 23, 48. And we also read about the story of Saul watching Stephen in verse 58. 
So the scene portrays, you know, what's dividing the new faith from, from Judaism, um, the honor that Jesus receives. What's glorious to Stephen is blasphemy to his audience. The two views couldn't be any more divergent. The vision of God's glory reinforces the conclusion that Stephen's view of things is the truth. The second appearance by Jesus to Saul will convince that persecutor that, of the church that Stephen is right about Jesus. So what about the application, the conclusion? First of all, I don't think that we need to be a martyr to receive salvation. Salvation is not earned, nor is it a reward for what we do. Salvation is a gift received through faith. Secondly, but salvation requires a response. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Three, should we be more aggressive for the gospel? You know, this morning we, we read the verse from 2 Timothy 3, is verse 12. It said, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do we put ourselves in tough situations to defend the gospel, or is it easier to just shrink and not cause a controversy? And finally, let's, let's pray and ask God to give us the boldness, the confidence, and the trust to be prepared to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty and loving Father, we bless you for the gift of your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Let's stand, if you are able, for our hymn of consecration, number 288, Take My Life and Let It Be, all six verses.
feet under him a little bit, but pray for Brookfield Christian, Refor Christian Reformed Church and Pastor Young Kwan. That would be great. And Shar. Could you please play for the veterans and the servicemen? Yes, we will pray for them. The 11th, I think, is the official holiday, but they should have our prayers and thoughts more regularly. Anything else? Beth? Toss it. He's a good throw. Other requests? Uh, Prayer request was um, for Usberg as a village. It's a post-Christian society, quite firmly now, and we cling to what we can here in Oostburg, and uh, one of the ways we do that is through the government, and we're, we're thankful for civil servants, and we uh, will pray that our civil servants would be uh, willing to, to maintain the, the Christian ethic and, and the law of God as as best we can here in, in post-Christian Western society, yeah. Thanks, Carolyn. Other prayer requests? Tom, your mom still head in the right direction. Tom, your mom still doing okay? Yeah. Good. Does anybody know about Annette? Those are just two that I had in my brain from the last few evenings. But good to hear, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Carolyn shared that uh, Annette Hendricks has been using oxygen and spending a lot of time sleeping, um, which suggests that her energy level is is uh, going down. So we'll certainly be praying for Annette, and we'll keep praying for Lorraine and Doris, and I'm, I'm thankful for Faye Mentink there in Oostburg, who looks after those ladies for us. So. Anything else? All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we get inspiration from men like Stephen who faithfully spoke true doctrine. We heard this morning about the impact of, of your, your word and its truth and what the, the correct teaching and correct understanding of your word can do in people. And we thank you for men like Stephen and many men like Stephen throughout the ages, men and women who have demonstrated that kind of faith. We know that it is not ordained for all of us to be martyrs, but it is ordained for all of us to suffer for the sake of the cross. And so, Lord, we take up your cross and follow in, in the way you've set before us, inspired by your Holy Spirit to, 
do the works that you prepare for us in, in advance, and not because it merits our salvation, but because you've called us to participate in it in gratitude for what you have already done for us. And so in a way, we look forward to suffering unto your glory. We thank you for the men in Classes Wisconsin who, who get to do that with us, and we thank you for the role in Brookfield Christian Reformed Church and in raising up young pastors and young leaders. We pray for Pastor Young Kwan Kim as he begins his ministry there at Brookfield CRC, a, a young guy with, with big visions and, and a great grounding. I'm, I'm thankful for a, a budding friendship already. We thank you for Pastor Peter and uh, the, the staff there at Brookfield, that they would uh, mentor him well, and it might be a great fit for, for both. I think also of Christ Community Church in Sheboygan and Covenant CRC in Appleton as they seek to fill positions. We pray that uh, you would bring to them men fit and ready to serve in the tasks that those churches have. We thank you for the abundance of ministry ongoing in the state of Wisconsin. And we thank you for involving us in it. We thank you for Pastor Drew and the many hours he gives and work of pastoral care and studying and uh, proclaiming the scriptures for us as a, as a prophet for us, speaking forth the word of God so that we might understand the times. We pray that you would bless him doubly with your spirit, that he would sustain in that good work. We think of, again, servicemen and women in a, in a different way who have served our nation. We ask that uh, you would be with, with families in this time who, uh, as we think of veterans in particular, can have reason to rejoice that their, their families are reunited and that uh, terms of service have come to an end. We thank you for protecting the life of servicemen and women who have served in the past. We pray also, we, we mourn with those who mourn for lost loved ones. We pray for government officials who serve us in yet another way. We think of our own village board and we're thankful for the many blessings we have as uh, citizens of the United States, citizens of the state of Wisconsin, and citizens of Oostburg, the village of Oostburg. We thank you for the commitments to your law that we see as foundation for all of that. We know that we, we cling to what's left of, of, of a post-Christian America, and Lord, we ask that, that we might not fade into the background and, and watch it slip away, but that we might fight for, uh, for ethic, for moral behavior. We thank you for Terry's work and and others in our church who have, have, have served at, at local levels, we ask that Oostburg might continue to be a place written about in, in national news because of its cohesiveness and its commitment to the law of God. We thank you that we have been that kind of shining light, and we ask that by your grace we might continue to be. Lord, we are reminded of the number of people with ongoing cancer treatments and uh, I'm, I'm certain I won't have them all here. It's a long list, but just pray for Linda and Randy and Shar and Lee and Chris. As, uh, they all undergo different treatments, different levels of care, different surgeries upcoming, and just ask that you be with them and their families as their families care for them. I thank you for the blessing of advancement in medical technology that, that much of this is treatable and uh, minimally invasive, but but, Lord, we know that still uh, regular trips to the doctor and schedules and, and, and that stuff is, is overwhelming and certainly life-changing. We pray that you would bring peace and comfort to those people. Lord, we pray for the many in our church ex experiencing broken bones and, and, and different ailments. seems to be uh, an epidemic here. We think of Paul and uh, all of the Rodriguez boys and, and, and Tim and uh, Laura Cougar with her foot, and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the list is, is so long. We thank you for testimonies like Michael Modals, who can say, 
Uh, the Lord was faithful to me in a time of healing, in a time of challenge, and uh, all of us may not have the result of, of uh, maybe a, the answer to a large prayer request or a large goal in life. You, you don't exist just to serve us, but we thank you that uh, you do give us those kinds of blessings. And so we rejoice in state championships and uh, returns to the basketball court and returns to work and, and cast being removed so that um, functionality and, and showering, even little things like that, can, can return. We ask that you would heal as we know you do and you will. Lord, we think of, as we have a sermon series titled Legacy of Faith, we think of the many in our congregation who have carried that on. I think especially tonight as we have the last few Sunday evenings of Lorraine and Annette. We thank you, uh, despite a couple of years of, of roller coaster of health, we thank you for uh, good health for Lorraine now. We pray that you would sustain that in her. And we thank you for great health that Annette has experienced for, for so many years. And now as she experiences her challenges, we ask that you would bless her with good health. And Lord, we ask that understanding that we ought to pray, your will be done. We think of Doris and Faye, the other ladies there in Oostburg. We uh, think of Audrey and, and Joyce and others that, that we don't get to see real regularly and who we miss dearly. Lord, we thank you for the legacy of faith in this congregation. Lord, as we end this time gathering together as a people of God, as Oostburg Christian Reformed Church, this tiny corner, your, your kingdom here on earth, we ask that you would send us out with eyes to see and ears to hear and, and spirits to discern and hearts to love where you would have us move and speak and act for, the, for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and sing the doxology? As we leave this place tonight, we go with the Lord's blessing that comes to us from Hebrews 13, verse 20. 
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.